we agreed that we were going to ask the crowd, and uh, we're curious. Who wants to tell us about artificial intelligence? What comes to your mind when you hear artificial intelligence? Is there anybody here? Who knows? Who knows? No one. Well, good that everybody came to the session, because obviously there, there's a lot to learn then. <laughs> Can you tell us a bit more? OK. Um, I think the first thing that comes to mind when some people hear artificial intelligence is robotics. We think robots are taking over. And uh, I, when I was on the plane coming, I told someone that I was coming for an AI conference. And then it went on and on about how robots are going to take over the whole world mm -hmm. and things. I had a great time talking to him on the flight. But uh, this is how I explain artificial intelligence to people. AI is with you, it's in your hand. Something is helping you to predict uh, the next text when you're typing. It's quite specific to you. It's new what you said the last time, it's predicting. Um, AI is behind the better photo editing. You're using it, it's already there. The robots are here, they're with you on your phone. <laughs> <laughs> Good. So during this session, we'll be talking more about how to use AI to help us understand the risk. And so what we will do is we will have four presentations from different speakers. Please keep your questions because after the presentations, we will have a panel discussion and then there will be some room for questions from the audience. Okay. So I'll be introducing the first speaker. Uh, we have Mattia Macrosini. Um, he has a PhD in information and communication technology from the University of Trento, Italy. Did I get that right? Okay, um, he works as a project manager and senior research scientist in the Smart City and Spatial Development team at German Aerospace Center. So we, uh, we made a great choice, the team made a great choice, and uh, Mattia is going to tell us more, and we hope you, had a, you have a great time listening to him. Thank you. So thank you very much for the introduction, and uh, I hope to keep you awake. It was a heavy lunch, so let's see. Uh, how it goes. So, uh, so, okay, perfect. So as you see here, the, the topic is uh, about, uh, uh, you know, Africa. And uh, if we can go to the next slide, please. In general, we know that urbanization happens and somewhere it went crazy. So next, please. So in general, monitoring urbanization, uh, then it's extremely important for several uh, reasons. And uh, uh, for instance, this is uh, related to any application uh, involving the analysis of human presence. Uh, and uh, here we talk about uh, uh, risk as related to this conference, but also epidemiology, socioeconomic development, population distribution, etc. Next, please. So in this framework uh, at the German Aerospace Center where I work, uh, we relaunched a new suite of products uh, called the War Settlement Footprint. And this includes uh, uh, different layers which uh, are going to be open and free and they have been generated at uh, high spatial resolution uh, that uh, allow, let's say, the mapping of the current and the past uh, global settlement extent uh, but also to estimate some other key features of the settlements, uh, like the percentage of empirical surface, the building height, and the population distribution. Next, please. So uh, the thing is that also we are starting now a new activity uh, supported uh, by the World Bank, uh, specifically uh, targeting Africa, uh, where our goal is to improve and regularly update uh, these layers, and also, uh, even more importantly, to do some analytics and assess the ability to properly track urbanization at uh, high temporal frequency, and here we have to see uh, how far we can go, but uh, the intent is to go even quarterly uh, for the entire continent. So next, please. So uh, the idea here is to introduce now uh, the, the products that we have been developed uh, or uh, we are developing, and uh, just to give you uh, an overview of uh, what's uh, out there and uh, what will be available to, to all of you. Uh, so the first layer uh, is named the uh, War Settlement Footprint 2015, and it's uh, a 10 meter resolution binary mask which outlines uh, and the extent of uh, all, I mean, uh, most of the settlements in the world, uh, almost all, I would say. And uh, actually, this, uh, um, this layer outperforms all the existing layers out there, and it has been generated by exploiting, uh, let's say, at the very same time, uh, optical and radar imagery, which proved to, which proved to be uh, complementary. And uh, we validated also quantitatively the effectiveness uh, and the accuracy of, uh, of the layer uh, against the 
uh, uh, 0.9 million uh, points that have been collected through with the support of Google and they've been labeled uh, uh, through uh, crowdsourcing photo interpretation of Google Earth imagery. So next please, and here you can see some examples. So this is, uh, this is the world, but uh, if we go to the next slide, uh, yes please, yeah. Already at this, I mean, every time that I look at this image, I think that, wow, I mean, it, it's something because even at this scale, uh, we can see what's going on, uh, and especially in this year, which is uh, uh, extremely populated. And if we, if we go to the next slide, I can show you uh, the, the, the main feature of this layer, because besides uh, identifying where you have, you know, the main settlement, I, I we also detect the very small ones uh, uh, where still half of the global population is living. So if we want to support uh, these people, we need to know where they are. So we can go to the ne next slide, please. And here we see, we see Africa, and uh, again, if you can click again. So uh, even in this case, you can see that we can really map uh, at high detail uh, regions uh, where you have a lot of very small villages, like down there we see Malawi, and here a part of Nigeria. And in the next slides, uh, I also have a more detailed example of this area in the Igbo land uh, part, uh, so southeastern Nigeria. And if you click, you can see what we can detect out here. So next, please. Yeah. So I think that uh, it, it, this is something because uh, uh, up to now this was definitely not possible. Uh, it was not possible to identify where this, these villagers were. So that, that's the main advance uh, of, of this layer. So if we move to the next one, uh, of course, uh, uh, this layer refers to the year 2015, so it's not extremely up to date, uh, but we are working, of course, uh, uh, to, to fill in this gap. And especially, uh, I have to say that for deriving the, the 2015 layer, we, we use data from Landsat, so this type of data that are available at 30 meter resolution. Let's say, since a while, and especially, uh, you know, from 2000 and uh, and then, and let's say, in 18, uh, there are uh, this type of data here, uh, Sentinel-2, that are available freely from European Space Agency at 10 meter resolution, and you can definitely see the difference, and this will allow us to uh, have uh, um, way more detail, and I would like to show you some examples, so next slide, please. So this refers to Johannesburg, and uh, if you go to the next slide, you can see what was the original product for 2015. I would say the results was uh, uh, particularly good. But if you click to the next, we can see what we can obtain with the new data. So we have extremely more detail, and it's as highly, let's say, it's even more precise. And we can really detect down to single houses in some cases, so extremely effective. And th the next case, uh, please, it refers to New York, and also if you click, you can see how it was the layer for 2015. So next, please. And uh, again, let, have a look to, let's say, to the zoom down there. Can you click again, please? And you can see how it changes. So again, we can basically detect everything. And uh, this is even beyond my original expectation. So uh, we are um, working towards uh, making this uh, global. And uh, I mean, we are doing some uh, heavy testing also in African regions. Uh, and uh, again, preliminary results there are, are quite promising. So next, please. But of course, I mean, if we want to model urbanization, we need to know what happened in, in, in the past. So uh, to, to tackle this objective, actually, we uh, generated, uh, uh, I'd say, I would say, uh, a revolutionary data set whose name is uh, WSF uh, Evolution, which outlines the settlement extent uh, on a yearly basis uh, uh, from 1985 to, to 2015 at 30 meter resolution. And this uh, uh, has been possible through the application of artificial intelligence and the processing of uh, the entire Landsat archive, which includes more than 7 million scenes. And let's say, just for you to know, the, the idea here was that we start from 2015 backwards, and uh, the main hypothesis is that uh, um, urban growth, uh, settlement growth occurred. So we do not consider at the stage where you have uh, some shrinking of the cities, uh, but I would say that statistically that just cover uh, say a small portion. So I would say that uh, the assumption that we make here is uh, reasonable in more than 99% of the cases. So if we go to the next slide, we see some, some cool stuff. I would say we have uh, the uh, animation that gives you an idea of the settlement extent uh, growth from 1985 to 2015 of, of Cairo. And uh, I mean, it was massive. And uh, if we go to the next slide, you can also see in the, this representation uh, where each color is associated to, uh, say, the specific year where we detect uh, uh, urbanization occurring. And uh, here we can definitely see a pattern which is quite patchy. So it uh, gives me the feeling that uh, here it has been planned. So it was not uh, an, an informal urbanization. And say, we can go to the next slide. We have another nice example referred to Dar Salaam where the pattern of urbanization here is completely different because you can see that uh, basically the, the main body of the city, uh, um, uh, let's say, progressively eaten, eats uh, the, um, uh, 
uh, the suburban areas. And uh, let's say it, it, uh, even in the next slide, this is, this is evident because if you can click, we can, we can see also, let's say, that uh, you have uh, the, the shading from, from the red to the blue uh, towards, towards uh, west. And uh, I also have another example in the next slide referring to Ouagadougou in uh, Burkina Faso. So can you click, please? Yeah, exactly. So here, you, you can also see that uh, uh, the, the growth was uh, somehow concentric. And uh, again, it was uh, uh, say, uh, also particularly consistent. And uh, next, please. So even here, this is reflected uh, uh, with, the, with the colors. Can you click? Th thanks a lot. So yeah, you can see that uh, starting from the center where it's red, you go out uh, and it becomes, uh, let's say, gradually violet. Uh, but um, uh, of course, uh, it's important, uh, thanks, to also to uh, give an information about the quality of the input data, because these data are available for 30 years, but uh, not homogeneously and, let's say, in, uh, in, uh, with the same consistency everywhere in the world. So th then to, to this aim, we uh, implemented this uh, score that's called the uh, Input Data Consistency Score that gives you an idea, I don't want to go into the technical details, of how good was the imagery there. And you can see that, especially here, if we have a look to the availability for, for the year 2000, we can see that, uh, come on, uh, here we had some problems because uh, th there are not so many data. So, of course, uh, uh, if uh, we have some results that uh, might not be correct in that, in that part, that they don't depend on the methodology, but uh, on the input data, but uh, we can use this score to do some nice stuff. So, for the first time now, here I uh, report an example of Germany. It's the first time that you can study urbanization with, uh, with data, uh, regularly updated, so, so you have a very dense series. So here we can see how uh, Germany, the, the settlement extent here in uh, square kilometers, grew from 85 to 2015, and we can see also some nice trends that, for instance, here uh, in proximity of the year 2000, it slowed a bit down, and then it started going up again uh, in 2013. But here we can see the case of Ivory Coast where we live. And, I mean, this trend here, if, if, you, if we look to the numbers, uh, it's, uh, it's a jump that it's uh, mm, a bit suspicious. So what I've done, next slide, please, here, was to here report the quality of the input data for each of these. And you see that, of course, uh, let's say the, the more you approach 85, the quality was worse. But then, the next slide, please, what we can do is some magic because we can apply some weighted empirical regression that somehow takes into account that uh, the information here is, uh, you can trust it less with respect to the other, and creates a model that uh, uh, we believe uh, definitely is more reliable and it uh, probably uh, reflects uh, the, 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 actual, the actual trend for, for Ivory Coast. And if you go to the next slide, please, here, I also compare it to, to the GDP. And we can see some nice correlations so that uh, in, the, in, the, in the 80s and the 90s, what, uh, it wasn't growing but not that much, so quite stable. Then there was the boom and uh, in the middle of the 90s. Then there was the civil war, so of course uh, the, the GDP is low down and here you can see that uh, the, 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 the speed of the growth was, was lowing down as well and then it's going up again. Uh, but we can also extend this analysis, let's say, to macro areas. So here, for instance, uh, I took into account uh, West Africa and you can see, for instance, that the different, um, uh, sorry, the different, uh, this is Africa, not West Africa, sorry, the, the different macro, uh, macro regions uh, how they developed, so you, we can see that really West Africa is growing really fast, uh, but as well as the others. Uh, but the next slide is even more informative because here, it's the, uh, I mean, we, we normalize based on the size of 85. So it means that the, the, you can read this graphic as how much uh, did the, each of these uh, regions grew with respect to the size in, 90, in 1985. So, sorry, no, no, I'm not finished. Can you go back once? Yeah, thanks. So, for instance, in, in this specific case, we see that Western Africa here in this blue line, actually, uh, um, proportionally, it's growing faster than, uh, than, uh, than uh, uh, Eastern Africa, and it was basically overtaking it in 2010. And uh, instead, I mean, you can see that also from here, Southern Africa is, is still growing, but not as fast as it was uh, in, in, uh, in the 80s and in the 90s. But the next slide, please. This is even more informative because it gives you really the, the real, it's, it, it represents the percent uh, growth rate. So it gives you at each year how uh, each of these uh, uh, regions uh, was uh, growing with respect to the previous year. So we can see how fast it was going. And we can, we can see here, for instance, again, Southern Africa was really, really, really slowing down. 
Instead, I mean, uh, Western Africa here was going particularly fast, then it slowed down a bit, and then it was super fast again, uh, let's say, between 2005 and uh, 2012. And now, I mean, in that period, then it slowed a bit down. But this type of analysis, I mean, enables you to do a lot of stuff. So this is just an example of what this, this layer enables you to do. So next slide, please. Uh, but I mean, um, of course, now we uh, I always talk about settlement extent. So binary information. So is it settlement uh, or no settlement? Uh, but uh, uh, we are working on now in a new layer. This it's called WSF imperviousness because uh, what we would like to do is to give you an additional information. So for each pixel, we can tell you basically what's the actual proportion covered by by paved surfaces, and uh, for this this somehow correlates pretty well uh, with the building density and. Uh, uh, let's say um, it's uh, an important input. It's uh, it's uh, uh, important, for instance, for uh, improving the distribution of the population. And uh, of course, uh, since we are talking about risk, for instance, assessing the risk of, of urban floods. And here, our basic idea is that uh, we uh, understand where we have some greenness, and we consider uh, as paved, so as uh, built up, or let's say covered uh, by paved surfaces, uh, in, you know, all the rest. So but I think that the example will be more explanatory. So if we can move to the next slide, please, you can see the example, this is uh, Johannesburg, South Africa, and uh, here, so besides the information about the growth, you see also the densification. So I have a look to this area, it's uh, always nice that, uh, I mean, at the beginning it's associated with the green color, so it means that it was not so dense, and then through the time, over 30 years, uh, it became uh, more red and more red. So next, uh, next slide, please, here we have the example of Abidjan, and we can see, have a look here, of how this area in the western part of the city tend to, be, to, to become extremely, uh, let's say, dense, and uh, even here, we have two trends. So one part here in the eastern sides, uh, it, it grows especially here and then become denser. Instead, in this part here, it's still growing, uh, it's still going green. And again, you can, you can do a, lo a lot of stuff with, the, with, with this information. In this case here, refers to Maputo in Mozambique. And the, the, the city is kind of sprawling towards the inland because we have the sea there. And you can see that uh, really some parts becomes uh, just, uh, um, just green. And the other, I mean, tend to be, again, more dense uh, and moving to, to these reddish stones. So, um, uh, please, uh, I mean, uh, I, go, I will go fast with the last two products. So, uh, what we are also aiming to do is to estimate the height of the buildings. And this, uh, uh, again, is possible uh, thanks to uh, that is a data set that has been made available from uh, the Japanese uh, um, uh, Space uh, Agency. And, and here, um, we uh, are aiming to, let's say, estimate that for the year 2015 because the data set refers to that period. So, if we go to the next slide, please, you can see some example. I mean, some of you might fam be familiar with, uh, with Washington. And if you click, you can see what we estimate. Yeah, so that, uh, let's say, this is the city center, which is uh, characterized by the presence uh, of, uh, let's say, taller buildings. But also here, for instance, there are, there are the famous malls, so Tyson malls, and also it's, the, it's, it's reflected in this map. And uh, uh, there's the next example referring to Cairo that we have seen before. So if you click, you can see here yeah, that uh, all these areas here, they are really characterized by tall buildings and they are properly captured. And uh, uh, and uh, yeah, and this this case also referred to the per river delta. If you click, please, that that's amazing because you can see down there uh, Hong Kong where uh, you just have uh, skyscrapers and Guangzhou up there and uh, here Macau. I mean, it's uh, it's an area where you find uh, more skys skyscrapers than normally than normal uh, buildings. And finally, and of course, you can combine this information. So the information about the imperviousness, the information about the the the, the 3D, and uh, try to use this uh, for estimating population. So in this direction, we are working on a product, the WSF population, uh, which aim at estimating the, the distribution uh, of, uh, of the population between 85 and 215. And if you click the next slide, I have an example here referring to Dar es Salaam. So this was what we estimated, for instance, uh, in uh, 1988. And then if you click, you can see our estimation for 2012 because we had the population information referring to, that, to those years and we distributed. So very last slide. Uh, so, uh, just for you to know, this, the WSF 2015 has been completed uh, and uh, it's uh, basically there to be released, so uh, it's something that will happen in the next uh, week or in case two weeks. But for the members of the bank, uh, they should be aware that it was, sorry, sorry, one second, almost done, that it was uh, already available uh, through the GOST team. 
uh, the WSF evolution, we are performing validation and we expect that to be out at the beginning of next year. Then the other two layers are, let's say, in the phase where we are refining the methodology uh, and uh, the population, of course, depends on these two. So uh, we reasonably expect that we can come up with these layers uh, open and free next year and probably a population in 2021. And this pr uh, project that we are uh, doing with the World Bank uh, will be completed uh, also end of next year. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mattia, for, for this presentation. And with that, I'd like to invite the next speaker to the stage, Daniel Kirsunov from Facebook. Daniel is an engineering manager in the Facebook SIG Spatial Computing Group. He holds a PhD in applied math from Harvard, and his primary interests are in signal image processing, numerical modeling, and distributed machine learning applications. Are we going to be able to follow this presentation? Uh, uh, yeah, I'll try to keep it very high level. <laughs> okay. Well, we'll maybe a little bit deeper, yeah. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Stage is yours. Mati um, um, great, did a great job explaining how the satellite imagery could be used to detect some macro uh, information about the cities. In this presentation, we're going to dig a little bit deeper and see what kind of information we can ex extract on the street level. Next slide. Uh, so, first of all, why Facebook is interested in maps. Turns out there are several places in our applications where we show map in the background. So when you do check-ins, when you check the local restaurants, you see a map right there. Uh, currently, we're using the open street map that have been uh, mentioned several times here before. And what we need, we need the high quality map with a global coverage. Next slide. Uh, this is the analysis of the open street map that, that we did several years ago. Blue color here means a map of high quality. Red color means that the quality could be improved. And this is where our, my team in particular is focused. Next slide. So this is a whole pipeline because the world is actually a very large place. It's hard to build a high quality map. So we're using a lot of artificial intelligence to help us in this process. The pipelines that I'm going to talk about here start with machine learning and uh, satellite image analysis. We go through some road extraction, and in the end, humans will do the road validation and contribute it to the actual map. Next slide. So this is, speaking about going a little bit deeper in our models, this is what is in the center of our approach. This is called segmentation deep neural network model that can take a very high resolution satellite image. It's about 50 centimeter per pixel. And in the end, gives us the answer. Is this particular pixel over there a road or a building? This is where we start. Um, next slide. Uh, but the question is, what is a road? Uh, as you can see in different parts of the world and different parts of the imagery, it could be very different. We could also have issues with cloud coverage and the street coverage, low resolution issue, and so on. So it's very hard even for human sometimes to tell us what's a road and, what, and what's not. Next slide. So we start with generating a lot of training data. And this is a fundamental for all the machine learning models, I suggest. This is the same to what you guys also did there. So there are humans, uh, could you go a little bit back for a second? So there are humans who, who would tell us pixel by pixel whether there's a road or not. And then we take this big black box model and train it on uh, hundreds of thousands or millions of images. Uh, nowadays we can tra train directly from the mapping data from the open street map so the humans are not needed for those basic uh, designs anymore. Next slide. Uh, so this is what machines, the very well trained machine, machine will uh, tell us in the end. So again, black uh, pixels here are the roads, white is not road area. But this is not enough, this is only the first step. Next one. So we do a lot of uh, standard computer vision uh, processing after that. We threshold the data, next slide. Uh, we trim data, connect them to make sure they work better and better as roads. And then in the end, we, uh, next slide, uh, we remove the island. So now you can see that the results already look like the road network in the city. So that's how it works. Next slide. And this is how it works, several areas. This is how a machine detects roads in different areas in the world. Next one, please. Uh, next. 
Yeah, this is a, a very interesting example, actually, because you can see uh, sometimes machine does phenomenal job detecting streets on the fly. Sometimes on the top here, it picked up the dry riverbed as a road. And this is where the human judgment is needed to tell the machine, no, this was actually incorrect. Next one. Another, another nice area with the, with the roads uh, in, in the forest. So the machine needs to figure out how they cut through the forest. Next one. This is Boston, where my team is located. But again, you can see that most of the roads in Boston are mapped. So in fact, we do not need this information to the map. Next one. So in the end, what we do, we take the existing open street map, we take all the roads in magenta that uh, the machine detected, and we only show to the user those final roads. Th and this is what machine suggests us for, for editing. Next one. Uh, how am I doing in time? Okay, so let us show, so in the end we combine, the, let's ru start running this video. Okay, we run it. Yes. Um, so in the end, this, that's what we did. We took the tool uh, that combines the machine, uh, uh, the machine intelligence and the human application. Can we run it, possibly? Nope, in this slide, just curious. It started running just a second ago, exactly. Yep. Perfect. Yeah, so uh, the machine, so first about the road. So those are magenta, magenta roads are suggested by the machine and the human editor can add it to the map directly or not edit if you think there are some issues. And the, there's a great work that done by Microsoft several years ago. And now we can, uh, the Microsoft uh, machine learning can detect the building footprint from the high-resolution high imagery. And our tool directly connects into this tool too. So we can also map buildings right there with a very high resolution. Next one. Uh, we use the same ideas to work with the building detection and to assess the population density. The machine learning is also the deep neural machine learning uh, model that work inside. It's a little bit different one that works with a mask of 32 by 32 pixels, so it's a regular classification model, but the ideas are very the same, pretty much the same. Uh, next one. So we detect the buildings, and this is how we could build a population map of the whole Africa. Uh, could you please run this uh, demo? So we first uh, look into the areas where people for sure do not live, use the basic model. Then we detect all the buildings that are located in the area, and then we work with statistical uh, university. It's called CC, and it's part of Columbia. This whole uh, has all the census data for different countries. And this is how we build the final population map of, of Africa right there. So all this data is free and downloadable. This particular set of, uh, uh, data set is called high resolution uh, settlement uh, layer. It's downloadable there, and the same thing is the roads that we find also could be downloaded and used for any application. Thank you for your attention. And yes, last question actually, before, I know you're gonna ask me, so let me answer it. Like, no personal Facebook data was used for this application. <laughs> Thank you very much for that presentation. So now, next up, we have Lindsay Higgins, the press officer for Mapillary. She lives in Sweden now, where she also got a PhD in geography, and now she's active in initiatives that promote computer programming in underrepresented communities. Today, she will share how we can collaborate and map the world around us with our own cameras. Thank you so much. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today. I'm going to bring it down another level and talk about mapping at the street level, but putting the power to map and the power of artificial intelligence into your own hands. So yes, we will talk today about mapping the unmapped world. Next, please. If you're not familiar with us, Mapillary is the street level imagery platform that scales and automates mapping. And we do this using cameras and computer vision, which is a form of artificial intelligence. Next. The world is changing incredibly quickly. The total area covered by cities across the world is set to triple over the next 40 years. And as you can see here, it's not just that new cities are popping up, but existing cities are growing much, much larger than ever before. Next, please. 
So we have a problem. The world is changing quickly, and traditional methods of mapping it are struggling to keep up with that level of change. But there's also a solution. I will keep, <laughs> there we go. To scale by opening up this data collection to any camera anywhere in the world, and also to automate using computer vision to extract the map data from within those images. So we're at a point where converting imagery to map data is now really a necessary component in mapping. Next, please. So I really do mean any camera anywhere, from simple smartphones, action cameras, up to dash cams, onboard vehicle cameras, and all the way up to professional grade mapping rigs. Next, please. If you can walk, bike, drive, you can map. Basically, if you have an area of interest, you can map it using Mapillary. Next, please. Our upload processes are very simple. If you're using your smartphone, you can capture and upload directly on the mobile apps. Otherwise, if you're using a different camera, we have a simple and easy to use desktop uploader tool. Next, please. If you want to take this a step further and maybe organize a larger project to capture an area with a team, you can set up a capture project to optimize your data collection. And this allows you to designate your area of interest, divide that area into smaller, more easily manageable tasks, and assign those tasks to your team members while also tracking their progress. And today, you can also turn any vehicle into a mapping vehicle. We recently came out with a customized dash cam specifically for mapping purposes. I won't discuss too much about that today. If you're interested in more information, please visit mapillary.com slash dash cam. Next, please. So this collaborative model, any camera, anywhere, it really works. Today, we have roughly 1 billion images on the Mapillary platform. And from those images, we've extracted about 50 billion map objects. Next, please. We do this using computer vision. Here you see a technique called semantic segmentation, where we're teaching the computers to see and understand what's in the street level images. So it's assigning a value to each pixel in the image to determine what's actually in it. So here you can see the computers identified the motorcycle, pedestrians, buildings, and much, much more. Next, please. So we are literally creating this living, breathing 3D representation of the world. Using all of these images on the platform, we take matching points between images in the same geographic location and use this to create a 3D reconstruction from these single 2D images. And combining the two techniques, the semantic segmentation with the 3D reconstruction, we can pinpoint on the global map the location of these map objects. Next, please. So currently, Mapillary is able to extract 42 different types of objects as point data for maps and about 1,500 different types of traffic signs. So everything, uh, objects including catch basins, fire hydrants, uh, junction boxes, manholes, utility poles, water valves, and many more. We're also anonymizing sensitive information in the images. At about 99% accuracy, we are blurring faces and license plates. So you can rest assured knowing that we are safeguarding the privacy of those who are in your images. But what about building resilience? That's really why we're all here today. So I'd like to talk about that a bit more. This year, we ran a campaign with Humanitarian OpenStreetMap team to map the undermapped world. So we asked for project proposals from all over the world uh, to ask the community how they would use street level imagery to map their areas of interest, but specifically around humanitarian concerns. And we had 33 teams from 27 different countries submit their projects. Next, please. I will uh, just briefly touch on one of the projects. In Erbil, Iraq, well, Iraq's been hit by 53 earthquakes over the last 12 months. And back in 2017, there was a major one that killed over 600 people and injured 8,000 more. So the team idea in Erbil was to build uh, resilience for earthquake disasters. Next, please. 
it was two team members who had experience working with the, the UN in humanitarian assistance, and they noticed that because of a lack of adequate and dependable maps, these humanitarian agencies were struggling to find routes to reach people in areas affected by the earthquakes. This is a quote from the team leader, Mohammed. This specific map will be an important tool when a disaster strikes to assess the situation more quickly. The aim is to provide relief workers with the tools to facilitate the decision-making process. Next, please. So over a one-month period, a group of up to 10 mappers, generally between two and 10, were able to capture over 100,000 street-level images just using the Mapillary mobile apps. And you can see they covered um, herbal in general, but also focused on more dense capture in one of the, the neighborhoods. Next, please. So from these images, the team used the automatically extracted traffic signs, manholes, and junction boxes, and added that data to OpenStreetMap. So they were able to make about 400 change sets in total using these images that they collected. Next, please. If you are staying for the rest of State of the Map, on Sunday, another one of our Map 2020 participants will be presenting about his team's work collecting <clears throat> street level imagery in the fight against illegal waste dumping in Uganda. That will be 12.30 in Kamo, so please do stop by. Next, please. And we are also raffling off a GoPro action camera, so please follow us on Twitter for more details about that so that you can join us on our quest to map the world. Next, please. So thank you so much for your attention. I hope you will join us, and let's create something amazing together. Thank you, Lindsay. With that, I'd like to invite our next speaker, Olaf Fehrmann. Uh, he leads the Development Seeds Project Strategy and Implementation, and this includes efforts to create better decision support tools, user-friendly applications that put insights about our changing planet into the hands of decision makers. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, so I'll be talking about putting the, uh, insights into the hands of decision makers. There it is. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? So as we've already seen, um, our capacity uh, to produce data um, um, is, is, is growing at a fast pace. Um, I have a graph on the right side where you see objects that are launched into space. This is monitored, uh, tracked by, uh, by, by a UN uh, agency. Not all of these are for Earth observation, uh, but the peak on the right is uh, spurred by uh, a lot of you know, satellites being, being launched into space that do, do, do Earth observation. So uh, we're collecting a lot of data, and, and as the, you know, the talks of the speakers before, you know, advances in, 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 in artificial intelligence um, yeah, really, really increase our capacity to produce data. Um, at Development Seed, um, we uh, work on a couple of tools uh, and, and, and technologies uh, that make it um, a lot easier to, to um, run machine learning on top of a satellite imagery or overhead imagery. Uh, this is an example, and I don't know if you can uh, hit start on the video. All right, what you would have seen is uh, Slovenia, so fast AI, so, oh, oh no, we're one slide further. Can you go back one? Could you go back one slide? No, that's forward. Back. Anyway, doesn't matter. So one slide before, uh, there was a tool, Fast AI Serving is one of those examples. Uh, uh, we built this uh, um, in the context of a project with, uh, with ESA called Query Planet, where we partnered with Synergize. And um, uh, Fast AI Serving, for example, uh, uh, allows you to do uh, very fast inference. Uh, and, and I would have had a real time video where we were doing land use, land classification uh, for Slovenia, and where you, on, on Sentinel data, where you see it, where, you know, you see in real time uh, how fast uh, the inference goes. Uh, label maker, one back, please. Yep. This one, label maker is another uh, example of, of, of one of those tools that we're that, that, that we're building. Label maker uh, makes it a lot easier to generate training data by packaging up satellite imagery uh, together with OpenStreetMap data. 
um, that you can filter if you're doing, you know, want to, you know, extract building footprints. You can filter OpenStreetMap in a particular way for, for, for building fo footprints, and then label maker packages uh, the satellite up and, and, and prepares uh, prepares the training data for your model. Um, so now we can go. Um, that said, um, um, w we do think that. So, so, so what I'm what I'm actually going to focus on in my talk a little bit is is the need to build be better tools uh, to put all this data that we're creating in the hands of decision makers, uh, right? Because we, we can't expect a uh, somebody at the Ministry of Energy or Transport to to use Label Maker or Fast AI Serving, right? They wanna they wanna get the they wanna get the data in uh, in their hands so they can drive insight quickly. Uh, in ways that they, uh, you know, when they need it and, 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 and how they need it. Um, there are two things, or there are a couple of things that we think are important about these tools, but two things that I want to highlight is um, open tools that allow people to see under the hood, uh, understand what is going on. We think that's a very important important thing. And then also uh, uh, combining uh, lots of different data streams. And we're going to be talking about two examples right now. And the first one is uh, Urchin. Urchin is a tool that we developed together with uh, MaxArb. Um, that allows you to monitor uh, urban change. Um, next slide. Um, so what you're seeing here is a change detection layer um, developed by Maxar. Um, so, so the yellow ones um, um, uh, are, are actually changes in the map. And what this is able to tell you is um, where your city is changing. And uh, then what we are uh, doing is, if you can go to the next slide, um, another example. So we compare, oh, uh, actually, sorry, one back. <laughs> I thought we, so, uh, w and what we're actually doing is not only a change uh, layer, but in this case also a layer from OSM, um, and then be a, you're able to compare those two and see where your map is outdated. In this case, we're doing OSM, but you could you know, and, uh, throw any other um, any building on a b other building footprint layer against it and, c and compare the changes. Um, next one. Um, yeah, so here here is another view within Urchin that also tells you uh, sort of um, um, you know w w where the differences are in the map. Um, and, oh, oh, okay, I guess. Um, can you go one back? Yeah, and this is another uh, a another view of where you can you can see the change detection layer indicating where your where your city is changing. Um, so another um, example is the housing passports project that we did together with the World Bank. Um, so um, um, in, in this case, what we're doing is we're combining insights from overhead imagery uh, with street level imagery. So a little bit what Lindsay was already saying, uh, what Mapillary is also doing. Um, so if you can go to the next slide. So what the World Bank is doing in, in uh, particular areas, um, We've done a couple of cities right now in Colombia, Lima, Mexico, um, Jakarta. So what they're doing is they're 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 uh, driving a car with street and, and capturing street level imagery, and um, uh, basically what they're interested in is depends a little bit. Uh, it, it changes from from neighborhood to neighborhood, um, but um, you know, um, in, in 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 Colombia, for example, there are. Uh, neighborhoods that are very prone to earthquakes. Um, so there they are very interested in, um, for example, buildings with large storefronts. Um, they're interested in knowing how many windows there are in a building, how many doors. <laughs> One second. So what we're doing there is so based on that on that um, street level imagery, and this is always uh, uh, imagery that's captured from the side. We have a model running that we trained on on, on these different classes. In this case, uh, what the model is predicting is whether the um, building is painted, yes or no. And if you go one further, um, so but what the model is basically giving us is that it can tell you for a, a 2D image, um, can tell you. Where the, where the windows are, where the doors are, uh, but what you're ultimately interested in is you ultimately want to um, be able to tell uh, whether a particular building, how many doors or windows it has. So this is the methodology that we use, is 
all these points are different captures, um, and then we know sort of the, the, the angle and um, uh, of, 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 of the object that, that's detected, and then we're able to sort of relate it back to a single building footprint. And then ultimately we're able to sort of put this in a platform like this, uh, where you're combining uh, the view from street level imagery uh, together with overhead imagery, and then on the right side, you have all the characteristics that we either uh, collect with the um, machine learning or from, from other data sources. Next. And then ultimately, the, the, the thing that I wanted to show you, and this is a little bit more of a proof of concept, is where what we tried to do is um, get the models that, that we were running on the mobile. Um, so basically allowing you to do inference in the field. You here um, take a picture, and then in real time, we're able to run the model. Uh, and this is, for example, very interested, interesting to do um, uh, verification. In. Yep, and that's it. So, and that was, yep, that was my presentation. Those were the two uh, examples that I wanted to highlight. Um, and yeah, that was it. That was a great one. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Good evening. Okay, my name is Wuriala. I'll be introducing myself, and uh, I want to share with you at work at Data Science Nigeria. Please, the slides. Okay. So, again, I'm Wuriala, and uh, this is our vision at Data Science Nigeria. We are raising a million AI talent in 10 years. And uh, next slide. Okay, I'm going to be reading this. We projected it in red and blue, so it's obvious, and everybody can see us. To build a world-class artificial intelligence, knowledge, research, and innovation ecosystem that delivers high impact and transformational research business use applications, AI for startups, employability, and social good use cases, such that in 10 years, Nigeria will become one of the top AI talent and knowledge destinations with 20% GDP multiplier effect. So we say there's a lot at work, 1 million AI talents in 10 years. Next slide, please. And um, these are some of the numbers that we have been able to do in two years. Uh, Okay, we have a book where we, uh, we, uh, we read out to some of uh, the people doing artificial intelligence to share their experiences and uh, what they think AI can do. And uh, on our website, we've had more than 600,000 direct downloads. Uh, we've had an uh, inter-campus machine learning competition with over 10,000 people. And uh, we have online courses where many people all over the world, Nigeria is our target, but... And, um, we had a very interesting event early in the year. It's, it's called AI Inversion, where we went to 30 universities across the country. We sent a tutor. Uh, there was a gathering, and they were taught about AI, machine learning, data science in those five days. And uh, the response was phenomenal. Next slide, please. Okay. So this is a uh, this is a uh, part of our, this is our plan on how to get one million AI talents in 10 years. We, two years is gone. We have less than eight years left. And um, so we have an AI hub where people can come in. We have a good internet. There's electricity. All you need to do is come in. And uh, we have classes running in cohorts. So we have the beginner classes. If you decide to show up, uh, the online classes and uh, the offline content. Okay, so whenever we think about solutions at Data Science Nigeria, we think of uh, resource constraints, and uh, that was the idea behind this AI Knowledge Box. AI Knowledge Box is simply uh, an hard drive with over 10,000 open source videos on artificial intelligence, on uh, machine learning, on deep learning. They are open source, and uh, we, we did this because in, uh, in our relating with our students, we found that many cannot afford internet, 
and things like that. So what we do, we send a, an AI knowledge box to your town, to your university, and then everybody just get the open, open courses and uh, it's graded in according to your knowledge. There's beginner, intermediate, and you just download and you have no excuse from internet. Next one. Okay, this is um, the book. It's free online. It's written by our convener, Dr. Lubayo Adekombi. Next one. Okay, this is really exciting. We're running an event right now called the AI Bootcamp. The whole country is excited. I came from the event, that's why I came late. And uh, uh, our participants from all over the country, they competed on Kagu, uh, AI City Leeds, and they are in Lagos right now. Uh, they, were, they are camped for five days. We brought some of the best in the world to help them to update their knowledge on AI and so that they can network because the only, reason, the only way we are going to scale the idea to get it all across the country is a uh, community, so we're not, just, we're not just teaching people to do right. We are building artificial intelligence community and uh, we've been getting great responses. Next one. Yes, um, about three days ago, this was launched in Nigeria. It's an artificial intelligence book for primary and uh, junior secondary school. We are not just um, getting people that are older, we are trying to get kids young. We are trying to um, the, the books, are, they are free, they are sponsored by that organization. And uh, so we, we're trying to get them young. We want them to have an idea of what AI is so that it can be in their thoughts. It's part of what they, can, they think they can study. And, um, and for this book, we're not just distributing. We will have a series of events where we'll bring teachers in from all over the country to teach them how this is done. So it's not just us giving the books, we, are, we, are we will be supporting the schools to help them to teach the right things to kids. Next one. Okay, earlier this year, uh, we won two of the top artificial intelligence award. Um, our convener, he won, he won it for impact. The impact is huge. The scale is moving all over the country and we won the second best research poster. Okay, I was uh, thinking this, so if you want to check us out on Twitter, the bootcamp is really exciting. You should check that out, people are tweeting about it. And uh, this is an example of what our, um, a typical class looks like in our artificial intelligence hub. And uh, a typical bootcamp, lab, uh, bootcamp, this was last year. And the next one, thank you. Okay, now I'm resuming duties. Okay, please, um, panelists, please come up. Okay, so we have a plenary session right now where we'll be asking those very interesting people interesting questions. Welcome. Okay. So, Danny, how does your, uh, Danny made a fantastic presentation to us and uh, this is the question that, yes, I came up with this question. I always ask this question. So, for everybody will be talking, they'll be talking about how their solutions work in low resource environments. Uh, was in your thought, like um, the solutions from Facebook, how does it work in systems where they are not even sure of the internet, they're not sure if they have access to data. So everybody will be telling us how their solution work in low resource environment. I think so we have two fundamental questions for mapping. First is how to get the base maps coming from satellite images. And the good thing there for, for satellite image, there is no limitations, right? The same quality of image you get in Europe, you get pretty much everywhere in the world. But the second problem is how do you do mapping itself when you're, because a, a lot of data when people do mapping comes through the internet, and there are many areas where it's very high, where the internet connection could be very slow. And this is a challenge, uh, but there are tools that allow you basically free download certain areas. So the one that I showed today works online, so you need to be plugged in online. 
but for the areas with a low internet connection, we are building plugin. People, maybe some people know, like JOSM editor, the cloud plugin in data is directly there, and there you can pre-download the large piece of the AI data to the slow connection, and then like work on your own on your own pace yourself. So that's that's our uh, that's our our approach for cleaning the data. Plug the research. Okay, Matia, do you have anything about that? Uh, well, actually, uh, yeah, I mean, in our case, uh, talking to the specific uh, uh, use case that I present in, the, in my talk, uh, all the products uh, that we are producing uh, will be disseminated open and free, and uh, uh, they, their size uh, is uh, allows you to download them, and once you have them, you can work directly offline, so with any GIS platform. So you don't need, uh, they are not so heavy. So of course you need ones to be connected to have them. Uh, but of course, <coughs> I mean, uh, having a look to your presentation inspire me because uh, uh, besides providing these guys with the videos uh, with the, you know, in Nigeria with the, with the box that you mentioned, uh, um, an opportunity would also be to provide them with type of data that they can play with. So if they have a PC, so why not? So that's something that maybe uh, you should consider. Definitely, I'll catch up on that. Okay, Lindsay. Yes, um, well, data uploading and, and internet access is a concern in many areas that are low in resources and, and, and infrastructural development. However, with the mapillary uh, tools, you are collecting the images and then uploading them later on once you do have access to Wi-Fi. So there's some steps you can take to make that process a little easier because you can normally plan on uploading you know, 50 plus gigabytes if you've been capturing for an entire day. So it's recommended to try and partner with maybe an NGO or a university, someone who has that you know, good internet access that you can come to later on and upload all of your images. Okay. Yeah, and I, I don't think it, it, it directly relates to the tools that I was showing. Okay. But we, we are building some, some mapping tools, for example, and I think it's a little bit the same where you're preparing, where, where, you know, if you, if you do f have a field data collection tool, uh, that you have offline capabilities, right? That you're uh, uh, th that you're in the field, being able to to, to collect data uh, uh, w without an internet connection. But but the models that are trained with but can they can they predict offline? Your pre-trained models on um, so like the this one with the windows. Th the, the, this particular one that I was showing, it's a prototype, and and and, and that's not possible. But but yeah, that, that that's the idea that you, that that you would be working towards something that you could do offline. Uh, w we are not there yet. Okay, Caroline. And so when we are talking about um, how to apply your, your different products in lower resource environments, from what I get from your answers is that it's mainly low internet connectivity. You guys have been answering that. Um, what about the computing resources? Do you take that into account? Or are there, are there other differences in the processing pipeline that you might have realized in the different projects? Or for example, in training data availability or things like that that you've come across that would need to be adapted when applying some of the tools that you have shown into case studies, for example, here in Cote d'Ivoire. Who wants to tell us about that, about computing resources? Uh, I can start because our model definitely computes huge amount of resources. To apply those d deep neural networks I talked before, you need to run through a lot of like very heavy machinery and very expensive GPUs. And our take on that is, uh, that we are running all those pre-computing parts on our pipelines and our machines and give people already pre-processed results that are much easier pre confused We thought about like publishing the deep neural networks model directly, but didn't do it exactly for this reason. We realized that in order to use it, uh, people need to use like excessive resources. So again, I would take just to take and pre-compute most of it on our side. So like when you are using your, your deep learning model, it's like out of all of the processing steps that are all the time that is needed, you're doing like 90% of it yourself? Yeah, pretty much. We do the, exactly. We take the satellite image, apply the deep neural network model, mm -hmm. extract the vectors of the doll buildings and roads, and this is the result that people use. And those vectorization are very lightweight. Okay. okay. I mean, yeah, I can share the same experience. Also in our case, we have massive uh, processing behind our layers. Uh, 
what we can also share and would be possible in case is the intermediate layers where the, the most of the processing uh, took place. Uh, that can also be useful, I don't go into the technical details, but for additional purposes, just not, not just dedicated to uh, identifying where settlements are, but it can be a support. The drawback is that in this case, if you want a global coverage, I mean, just talking about the WSF evolution, all the intermediate layers sum up to 1.5 petabyte of data, which is not really easy. 1.5 what? Petabyte. So uh, one petabyte is 1,024 terabytes. So it's a lot. Uh, <laughs> it's really a lot. But in this case, it probably you should think about uh, in case targeting a specific region. So it, you will not be able at all to uh, do any specific analysis at a large scale. But at least if you're interested in a specific area, in a specific community, that's something that uh, might be an option. But it also provided besides the FANA product, also with intermediate products that allows you to play even further, something like this. But processing is really an issue, of course, uh, without the internet. Yeah. Okay. Lindsay. I guess I'm kind of singing the same song where um, the, the data concerns and the, the processing comes in uploading the images. All of the computer vision application um, analysis happens after the fact. So we are running our computer vision models after all of the images have been uploaded um, and then making that data accessible to who needs it. Okay, uh, about that, how is Mapillary selling um, our Mapillary works to non-technical people? Because uh, many of the things that we are doing, um, there are policy makers that are not interested in the nitty gritty of uh, what the deep neural network is, what the CNN is. Um, what, is the, what is the team at Mapillary doing uh, to sell this idea to non-technical people? Well, um, the product itself is, is data. So we are making data available, but also we make the images available. So when I'm you know, speaking to, for example, someone who just you know, wants images for the image sake, it's about you know, preserving the memory and being able to revisit areas of interest. And that alone can be a great source of information. Um, so it's... Um, yeah, I mean, it's an interesting question about making something that's, you know, very technical, available on you know, a level to anyone who can understand it. But I think it's, it's also about the common goal. You know, we all want to understand our world and uh, make better use of the resources that are in it. So I think that common goal can really help unite people underneath this you know, umbrella of what is very technical. Okay, I, I think I'll, I'll, I'll direct this to Mattia. You're the one in government, sort of. So how do you, how do you sell your ideas to uh, policymakers who are not interested in the petabytes, uh, pre-trained model? Have you, are you part of the team making this to them that, okay, we make this decision, this is how it goes, or you're not part of that? Do you ever have to explain what you're doing? to non-technical people in yeah. government? <coughs> uh, not to government, actually. Okay, we are a government organization, but I mean, it happens that uh, I have the chance to discuss with uh, uh, some policy makers sometimes, uh, depending on, on specific situations. So yeah, that, the, 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 to come to a language that uh, is, uh, let's say, uh, understandable, it's not that easy. Uh, but uh, I, th I think that, uh, okay, I mean, uh, uh, as you said, uh, just in general, People are getting more and more aware of what artificial intelligence is, so it's also easier in general to sell, to, to explain what one is doing, despite that there are still some barriers, as you were mentioning, about, uh, you know, they, some, someone still thinks about robotics, etc. cetera. <laughs> so, but we will, we will, I would say, I will, we will bridge that gap. I mean, I think that it's not that far. So uh, there are, I mean, it's getting part of our lives, uh, and uh, yeah, mo most of, of, of the people don't, don't realize, but... Uh, yeah, the awareness is uh, getting higher and higher. And they even, let's say, concerning yeah, this uh, governmental uh, uh, people, uh, I, I think that uh, you know we are in, in, a, in, say in a good shape. Despite, I mean, I don't have uh, such a huge experience, but uh, that's a more uh, personal feeling. Okay. So also for the others, I mean, uh, Lindsay, you you mentioned okay, we we need to find a common goal. Um, and, and we have a lot of things that, that we are selling data. I mean, coming into Rua's question now about how do you communicate with perhaps with policymakers, or if we think of now, for example, we hear at the Understanding Risk Conference, where a lot of it is about disaster risk management, 
Are they, can you also give um, some extra thoughts on how you are translating your, your data that is being produced into kind of a, a tagline that you are selling to people at the Understanding Risk Conference, to applications on disaster risk management? I think if we're starting to talk about applications in translating the data, for, that maybe this is one for Olaf here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah sure. Um, um, I think, um, yeah, that, 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 I mean, that was my, my, my presentation was, was about putting uh, uh, insights into the hands of decision makers, right? So, so yeah, we, we think it's very important. I think uh, it's very important if um, to provide as much uh, insight into the, uh, the whatever the, the underlying model or, or approaches, uh, uh, insight into sort of the assumptions that go into your model. Uh, we're doing, for example, uh, w w a project also with the World Bank and, and KTH University, which is around least cost electrification planning, um, where we're, we're, we're showing uh, sort of per settlement what a what least cost electrification option is. Um, uh, I think it's very, what the, the tools that we're building for the decision makers, uh, we're really going, um, we're doing the best to, to really expose the underlying assumptions, the, uh, the, the, the data input layers that go into it, for example, so that users can sort of uh, get, uh, 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 build more trust in, in, in sort of the output of the model. I think that's one of the very important things that, that we try to build into, into the tools that we, that, we, that we make. Okay, so everyone is gonna answer this. We're starting from Danny. What's the simplest way to explain artificial intelligence? We have a crowd here. We know that not everybody here is a, uh, what's your simplest way of explaining artificial intelligence? So we'll start from Danny to Mattia. Uh, Olaf is lucky, he's at the end. He has a bit more time to lucky. think. <laughs> yeah, you have some time to think. Um, in my mind, the same piece as any other piece of machinery, right? Uh, I came here to play in a car. I, to be honest, I have no idea exactly how the car, car works, like all the internal parts. But I know it brings me from point A to point B. So in my mind, that we even don't need to explain it in so, so many detail. As soon as we show that this, uh, the methods that we can show you presented today are useful, that they can bring it from point A to point B, people will trust it more and more in the future. And again, it could be rock inside inside, but we don't have to be rock inside this to, to use it. But it is on us to prove you that what we're doing is useful. Uh, well, I mean, I share basically the same opinion with you. I would also like to add what is not AI also, in the sense that uh, uh, sometimes uh, people expect that AI solves all the problems. So you click the magic button and it's there. And it's actually not the case, because uh, it's a powerful tool that uh, helps us uh, uh, I mean solving critical problems uh, or let's say supporting where a lot of manual interaction would have been needed. But as we have seen in the presentation concerning the roads uh, or the ones I mean, presented by Olaf, uh, actually uh, then the, 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 the human interaction is always at the end uh, somehow to put the final word. So it's a tool, but uh, I mean, you can trust it up to a certain extent. And uh, I mean, in some cases it fails uh, because uh, of course it cannot cover all the possible ranges. I mean, it, it can really not substitute so far I mean, human brain, uh, and all uh, the experience that one gains uh, to 30, 40 years, uh, uh, let's say, working in the field, for instance. Uh, so that's my, that's my thought. Okay. Okay, so I think one of the, the simplest and easiest ways to look at artificial intelligence is it's um, your teaching machines to do the boring work for us, to automate the processes that are tedious, that are time consuming. It's not stealing that work from us, it's allowing us to do our jobs better and faster. Okay. It's nice you said that. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and, uh, yeah, yeah I, I fully su subscribe to that. That's also how we think about uh, machine learning, for example, right? For us, it's, it's, it's not a unicorn. It's not, a, you know, it's, it's not something that produces great results for us. It's really figuring out how machine learning can supercharge, especially when we're talking about map mapping, uh, how it can supercharge human mappers, right? And uh, we've used it in, in, in a couple of occasions. One of the examples is, for example, we're mapping the high voltage uh, uh, electricity network uh, or transmission uh, network 
in, in a couple of countries and, and where we're using uh, machine learning really to point um, human mappers to those areas where there's a high likelihood uh, of you know, existence of, of transmission network. And uh, we've done it in a couple of countries now and what we're seeing roughly is that uh, it speeds the, the mapping up 35 times, right? It, so, so, 35 so times. 35 times. So, so we, you know, we, we've had people uh, uh, do mapping from scratch for a full area, and if you then compare that with the speed with which they can, can, can map uh, with that predictive layer, it's roughly 35 times, and I, I think that's only the beginning. Mm -hmm. and, and it makes sense, right? Because transmission network is an extremely sort of sparse uh, 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 object. Uh, um, you know, uh, if you would have somebody look through all the tiles in a the country, they'll be looking at 99.9% .9 will not have any transmission network. So if you can have them skip that, instead focus on the on, 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 on those areas where there's a, like li li a high likelihood, mm -hmm. uh, you can really speed up their work and, and, and then still have the benefit of, of the quality with which humans are, are able to produce. Uh, you know, they're able to produce very highly accurate uh, mm -hmm. data. So uh, yeah, I think. Okay. So. We're going to be fair with those round. We're starting from Mattia. So Mattia, <laughs> Mattia, when was the first time you, you, you came in contact with artificial intelligence? And what were your thoughts the first time? Like, uh, do you remember? Everyone is going to be answering this. Wait, you mean? Like, uh, the first time you had AI, was it in school? Did yeah. something come up at work and you just... I think that uh, the first time probably I had it in some books when I was a teenager or something like that. So just uh, the idea of the artificial intelligence. Then when I was when I was at the university, actually, I'm old fashioned. So I, I still prefer to call it sometimes machine learning because at the end, that's what it is. I mean, OK, artificial intelligence is nicer. But I mean, I've been studying at a university, you know, machine learning and it's and it, it's still the same. But of course, uh, and uh, let's say I, I personally feel that, uh, yeah, really, it's it's amazing. Um, I mean, I was at the university not 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 long ago, so I finished uh, that in 2004. But I mean, it, it feels like uh, uh, in Stone Age, Stone Age, because I mean, uh, it's still thinking how much processing I needed to process, uh, you know, a thousand by thousand pixel ra radar image. At that time, I had to really got crazy and to to see what's the status now. It's it's amazing. I mean, that's amazing. So, yeah. Um, but I think that it's something old. That now it's really seeing, uh, you know, it's uh, it's past moment, and uh, let's see how long it will last. Hopefully, quite long. Okay, we're going to Olaf. I'm sparing Lindsay and Nadia. So, when was the first time you heard about artificial I, intelligence? I, I, I'm not sure. I think it was maybe in a professional context four or five years ago. I guess, or five years I guess ago. that we started, and and it was really, um, I, th I think, w with us. I, I don't know. It was I think a summer intern. That sort of started doing some some road extraction or some something, extraction. right? And, and and I think that for us was the first time that we, uh, yeah, really started thinking about this in a very serious uh, serious way. Okay, Dancer, your turn. So you're not sparing me. No. <laughs> <laughs> I th well, um, now that I'm mean, working in a space where artificial intelligence is something we talk about, you know, on a daily basis, it's little more obvious to me that it's played a role you know in my life longer than expected um, and then I can also think of other ways that I wish it had played a role <laughs> I mean when I was sitting at my desktop and manually delineating lake shorelines it would have been really nice to to have a little bit of artificial intelligence on my side at that point um, but no I mean this is I'm a, I'm a geographer and I'm excited about the the applications for for artificial intelligence, but it's quite new for me. Okay, Daniel, Daniel, we still have. Uh, my story is simple. I s remember very vividly how Deep Blue beat it, uh, Kasparov in chess. Kasparov was the world champion at the time. And for me, it had, the, the way how Deep Blue did it had nothing to do with, with Deep Neural Network. But I remember such an impression, you know, AI is coming, you know, the machine <laughs> can do something a human cannot. <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to be answering this last question myself. The part that I find most interesting about artificial intelligence, it's in NLP, uh, the concept of word embedding, um, the, the concept of a word is known by the company it keeps, 
I tried it on my local language, it worked. Like, it wasn't just English. I, I thought that was really smart. Like, uh, my attraction to AI, there's so many cool stuff here that works. So, Mattia, what excites you the most about AI? Is there a particular algorithm, a particular library that you just love, that makes you happy every time you like? I mean, really, what uh, it enables me to do. I mean, really, uh, seriously, it, uh, I, I could do what I've shown here, and I could not imagine that it was possible. If you would have told me five years ago, I would have said, you're crazy. I mean, come on, it's not possible, really. Uh, and now I mean, we're here discussing about that. So that, 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 that's really, I mean, a, a key to the future. Okay, Caroline, do you want to tell us what excites you the most? Like, what do you do with AI and you're just like, this is cool? <laughs> well, um, good question. It's, it's a lot being here, I think, especially the, the applications of once you see, once AI gets rolling out, it's like, okay, now we're, we're talking about buildings, we're talking about roads, but what is the next step? I think it is only a part of the processing chain, but by having these products, we can ask questions that we never thought that we would be able to ask. Like, if we see how the, the cities are growing in Africa, it's like, okay, what does this mean for urbanization? What does that as actually tell us what's happening? What it, how can we learn to plan better? What is the connection by enabling all of the other applications? Cool things. So do you think... Uh, it's cool. Danny, do you want to tell us, like, what excites you the most? Uh, Olaf, I'm coming for you. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I will second on the opinion that the most exciting part for me is that the machine can do a lot of boring work. So we can outsource all this boring work to the machine, and then it turns out that a small team of talented engineers can do a huge amount of things that were not possible before. And I'm looking forward for, for the new problems. Okay. Olaf, do you want to tell us? Um, we, we're ready to take questions. Voila. Okay. Okay. Which is that? Okay. Interesting. We have the mics. We can stay. Okay. Do you want to come forward? Okay. I'm in English, so maybe you can give them the deck. Hi, guys. A question. I'm very impressed about uh, the series of questions related to your uh, artificial intelligence experience. Well, a question to my pillory. Uh, I don't understand really the schema. I give you an image, then you make for free, right? Basically. Then. Uh, you mapillary make uh, analytics over it and make out a business of, out of it? And how is the returning to who provide mapillary the information? Because, well, you basically provide me an image that I already have in my mobile, correct? Back. And then you collect a lot of imagery, collect a lot of information. How do the mappers are returned in change of the way that provide mapillary a lot of information? Well, when it comes to like open street map, <laughs> we have committed to always making the images and data from those images available freely for editing open street map. So a lot of community members are, you know, contributing imagery for, for that purpose to, to use it to make edits to the map themselves. So all information contained into Mapillary are public available? For, for OpenStreetMap. Um, we do offer commercial licenses as well for the, the images and the, the data for, for commercial products. But when it comes to, to OpenStreetMap and like um, humanitarian OpenStreetMap editing for, for this risk assessment purposes, like that data is, is open. We're, we're in, integrated into the OpenStreetMap ID editor, for example. Okay. Thank you. Actually, may I add to that? Because not only you do that, you also contribute the sign that you detected for the roads, right? The post processes of the AI is also available with OpenStreetMap. I use it a lot. I find it very useful. So thanks a lot. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I'm Kato Drebo. I run a tech hub back in Liberia. And the uh, issue of explaining AI and machine learning it's also a challenge for me. Um, I just have a few questions, particularly to Lindsay and the Mapillary team. Uh, for the past, since 20, uh, 2008, 
My hope had been hosting up in Paris. Particularly back then, we were using uh, Google Map Maker. And we worked from communities to communities, adding businesses, offices, and everything there about on Google Maps using Map Maker. After a couple of years, that tool was shut down. We could not have access to continue to add to the communities. We, but most particularly, we didn't have access to retrieve that document and repurpose that data that we have contributed to Google Maps. Of course, we can access it on the map, but we can't retrieve the data for repurposing. So my question to Mappy Larry, um, actually two questions. Um, since last year, uh, I was introduced to Mapillary in Kampala, um, and being a passionate person about open data, about getting communities online, uh, I have personally used Mapillary extremely all around my city. Um, recently, we have a project, the machine learning project, and we are also now extensively using Mapillary to collect imagery of street views. Um, most times when I'm asked with, from policymakers about the privacy of the content, because we have the camera capturing different information. Um, I mean, from your presentation, you showed that after a period of time, um, the privacy data is being either blurred or taken out, like the example of the lesson plate. But I want to know how long does it take from our contribution, especially with, you know, what if, with Liberia and the African data that is now placed onto your platform. How long does it take for your machine learning algorithm to blur out or extract out the privacy content. And the second question is, how long or how soon will we, particularly as African nations, be able to extract or see a 3D version or model of the data we are contributing to Mapillary? Uh, when it comes to the anonymization, that is is instant. The images are not published um, until they've been blurred. That happens during the processing pipeline. So from when you upload the images and the moment they appear on the platform, they will be anonymized. Um, and I'm sorry, the, the 3D model. Um, I, I don't have an answer for that. I'm sorry. You can go onto the Mapillary platform today and see all of the, the data that's been extracted from your images and explore your images as well by scrolling through and seeing it at that street level. Okay. Sorry. One last question. Uh, and again, it's from my government. Um, can you say in this public manner that uh, Mapillary is going to remain as an open source platform? that we are going to continue to contribute our data and also we're going to be able to have access to that data. Or like, face, uh, like Google Map Maker, are you planning that as soon as you get these two popularized and being used globally, you're going to kind of shut it down uh, or you are going to convert from the open access to a paid service? You mean the data itself? The data itself. Remaining the, the data. Well, no, we, from the very beginning, we've pledged that all of the images and the data from those images on the Mapillary platform will always be freely available to OpenStreetMap. Thank you. Je vous remercie et vous félicite pour pour les présentations qui sont vraiment enseignantes. On a appris beaucoup. Et nous, à notre niveau, on définit l'intelligence artificielle comme assistance à l'intelligence naturelle. C'est l'homme qui crée. Comme vous l'avez dit, les véhicules, on les a créés. C'est un besoin d'être plus rapide que nous parce qu'on réfléchit mieux, on avance physiquement. C'est notre compréhension de l'intelligence artificielle. Je suis architecte de profession. J'ai commencé, je connais les rudiments de dessin, d'être plus rapide sur les logiciels. À cet effet, j'ai vu que vous avez pris euh, euh, la masse des zones urbaines pour avoir votre présentation. J'ai vu que vous êtes en train de faire les photos par véhicule. Est-ce que ces images nous donnent les caractéristiques. Je veux dire, 
euh, les, les gabarits, les hauteurs, comme vous l'avez dit, précis de ces zones urbaines qu'on veut identifier et étudier. Si c'est le cas, comment aux, ex aux expertises et formations des volontaires sont disponibles comment et quels sont les modèles de l'accompagnement que vous allez assurer à nos volontaires Quelle approche sociale d'intégration d'intégration et d'adaptation de ce nouveau produit à nos jeunes volontaires. C'est-à-dire, on veut la technologie, mais aussi la technologie intégrée à nos valeurs, à nos moyens de bord. Quelles sont les approches que vous allez définir par rapport à ces aspects Par rapport à cela, euh, si vous avez des renforcements des capacités de vos communautés, où sont ces lignes, c'est-à-dire ces produits seront disponibles quand et comment on les partagera avec nous. D'où l'intérêt que nous portons beaucoup à ce map qui venait spécifiquement par rapport à cela parce qu'on est en train d'élaborer notre schéma en directeur de Bamako. Donc, euh, j'ai vu des outils qui pourront vraiment nous être très utiles par rapport à tous ces levées que vous avez vus, surtout avec euh, le map. Donc, euh, si vraiment c'est des produits qui sont disponibles, nous aimerons comment les avoir et nous accompagner. Je vous remercie. So good. Um, yeah, I think that uh, I got the, the most of it. I had a problem with the translation, but uh, uh, thanks for your comments, I, uh, I mean, and uh, sharing your opinion. Uh, actually, in the specific case of our products, uh, um, of course, uh, as I said, everything will be open and free. And uh, you raise a, a very important point, and we had also a discussion with, uh, with Caroline yesterday about the very same thing. How can local people eventually allow us to further improve? Because, of course, these are global products, and in general, they are good. But if you have to really use them at the national scale, that can be super effective, regional as well, but really, you want to use it for a city, they have a value, but they, must be, they can't be perfect. Well, I mean, they still have some error. And of course, here, volunteers can definitely improve. And uh, uh, on the one hand, uh, they can identify where errors are. On the other hand, uh, and that would be even more ambitious, but that would be amazing if uh, they, there can be uh, the possibility of having training information. So, uh, I mean, from, from the locals to uh, be given as input to the artificial intelligence. Because so far, for instance, to characterize, to identify where the settlements are in my case, I have to do some heuristics, so some analysis that might be sometimes wrong. So, and especially in critical areas, where it's really difficult to see where settlements are, even if you have a look you know, to, to, uh, to a satellite image uh, without uh, any help uh, of uh, artificial intelligence or by yourself, it, sometimes it's challenging. So, of course, the, the locals here would play uh, a super role, especially, I think, that some rural areas uh, in, uh, in, in Africa that are extremely challenging or, you know, challenging cities that evolve so far, uh, super fastly. So there, uh, it's absolutely something that we have to tackle. I don't have an answer to that. I know that uh, uh, capacity building would be needed, but, uh, I mean, here it's probably where we should uh, uh, think a bit further and because, um, of course, OpenStreetMap is an option because if you have some information shared there, which is not even complete to a city, that can be used uh, you know, in, in, this, in the models that all we use. So I think that OpenStreetMap is an extra, so that, that's an option. Another one would be also to, to train what's really necessary. So to have some uh, easy tools uh, where probably you need uh, some internet, but uh, where you uh, train uh, eventually some potential volunteers uh, with the information that you need. So kind of crowdsourcing that you give you know, some examples that they, that they can learn from, and then they can simply click uh, you know, do the enabling whatever you need. This is something that to, so far we have been doing, for instance, for the validation of the WSF215. So we, we, we teach a crowd, okay, it was an educated crowd from Google, uh, but there, I mean, we provide a lot of examples and then people could learn and then really help us uh, in identifying what, I mean, the labeling the information that we needed. So of course there's a lot to do there, but I think that uh, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's, um, it's something that would absolutely help. Would anybody else like to re react to that question? Or not? No? It's just, it's an open opportunity. Yeah. Uh, let me just, uh, I totally agree with the previous opinion. So um, even when machines do 90% of the work, 
there are some local knowledge that need to be used because there are a lot of things that could not be seen from the satellites. They're not there are things that machine cannot make a decision. For example, if some road is blocked by, by the gate, if you know, sometimes machine confuses rivers with the road. There are a lot of things that only local volunteers could know. And this is what we notice as the OpenStreetMap conference that will uh, continue tomorrow. We'll focus a lot on how to build this community of the volunteers that can support and build the map like locally. And I think this is a very big challenge. And we should be building the tools that are, real, that are good, easy to use and that are available for the volunteers across the world. And that's what we are aiming for. Thank you. So I would like to ask you to keep the rest of your questions until the, the next break. I'm, I'm very sorry, but we're running out of time and we started a bit late. So um, we will get into a very big trouble with the organizers if I let you ask a question. But please keep it and, and come find us in the break. Yes? Okay, thank you. Um, with that, I have two more slides that I would like to show with some additional resources if you have some more questions about how to use machine learning in disaster risk management. Can I get them, please? Okay, so the, the first is a guidance note uh, developed by GFDRI about using machine learning for disaster risk management. And this document is intended more for uh, somebody who's not a technician who's interested in learning a bit, like, okay, how can I incorporate machine learning into disaster risk management? And what are kind of the questions I need to ask as I set up the project? And then the, the next slide. Um, shows uh, another upcoming AI challenge where, which incorporates some of the, the labeling done through the Open Cities uh, project, so done also by, by people on the ground and, and people living here, where we are combining the labels made of the buildings with uh, different drone imagery, and we're setting up a challenge. So for those of you who are more interested in, in the coding point of view, please have a look. Um, you can show it at the next boot camp as well because there, there's a nice uh, prize as well. And um, we'll be talking also more about that tomorrow in one of the State of the Map sessions. So I would like to give all the audience a very warm thanks for your attention and for your interesting questions. And also to, to the speakers here, I would like to ask you to give them a very warm round of applause. Thank you. OK. Thank you, everybody. We had a great time. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. OK. Yeah, we'll be around. Please continue asking questions.
Yeah. 